please follow with me in your bulletin that you have. Gathered in Christ's name, let us praise God who is our certain hope in all life's varied circumstances. I am, I am the resurrection and the life, and the life says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We have come together within the strengthening fellowship of friends, family, to praise God for the life of Virginia.
us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. We thank you especially that in the night of our grief and the shadow of our sorrow, we are not left to ourselves. We have the light of your promise to sustain and comfort us. Through our tears, give us the vision to see in faith the consolation you intend for us. In your mercy, grant us the unveiling guidance of your saving word, both in life and in death, through Christ Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen.
but usually she would come to the young adult class, which later became known by some as Younger at Heart. <laughs> Every time she would meet me, she would say, are you the new pastor? I would respond by saying yes, and she would reach out her hand to me to shake it and said, I'm Virginia Whitlock. I'm so happy to meet you. And I would respond in kind, Virginia Whitlock, it is so nice to meet you too. We did that many times as she needed us to do until she became familiar with who I was. In all the times I visited Virginia, I never saw her in a bad mood. She always smiled and was always happy to see me. I believe in the exchange of emails I have with Martha, Virginia talked a lot about smiling with her. When I first started visiting Virginia at Heritage Woods, she couldn't always remember who I was. I would greet her by saying, hi Virginia, it's Pastor Paula. I came to give you communion. After several visits, even though she usually couldn't remember my name, she got to know the sound of my voice. She would smile and always thank me for coming. Before I ended our visiting time with her, we would always have communion together. We would hold hands and then we would always say the Lord's Prayer. The first thing she would usually say to me every time I visited her was that she really missed church, but she couldn't come because Martha had taken her keys and she couldn't drive. I would chuckle inside, but always tell her that she was in my heart and our hearts on Sunday morning. On one visit, after she told me that she couldn't come to church because Martha had taken her keys, she admitted it probably was a good thing because she could always find her way to church, but sometimes she had trouble finding her way home. I often wondered if in her heart and mind, home was still on Lilac Lane. When I would visit Virginia at Heritage Woods, we would talk about whatever she wanted to talk about. Often it was her church. She loved the Lord and oh, she loved this church. Sometimes she would forget some details and get frustrated and apologize that her memory was not what it used to be. And I would reassure her that it was okay. I also had memory problems. Virginia transferred her membership to FCC in 1946. She taught Sunday school in the nursery for 11 years and taught fifth graders and sophomores, the loyal friends class, the young adult class. Martha wrote to me that since she was unable to finish college, she guessed teaching at FCC helped satisfy her desire to teach. Virginia was also an elder and on the board and a member of Christian Women's Fellowship. A retired teacher introduced Virginia to books at a very young age. She loved them and was an avid reader. Later in life, her son-in-law Jim read Lee Child and James Patterson and loved discussing them. Reading took her to new places and often filled lonely times when she was growing up. One thing we know is that she didn't like sports, but enjoyed socializing if she was invited to somebody's house for a game. While Martha was sharing her love of sports with her dad, Paul, Virginia was happy to stay at home with her son, Paul, and read a book. He took after his mother and became an avid reader. Virginia was generous with her time and resources. She loved to entertain neighbors and those in her community. She was a skilled seamstress for her daughter Martha and her granddaughters Amy and Susan. Besides her activities at the church, she was a member and past president of BEO, board member and past president of Centraia District Library for 27 years. She served on the Kaskaskia College Foundation for 18 years, the Illinois State Library Advisory Committee, and local American Red Cross Board. Additionally, she was a Murray Center volunteer and both a Girl Scouts and a Cub Scouts leader. 
For her service and contributions, she was recognized as an AAUW Woman of the Year, Illinois Library Associate Trustee of the Year, and BNPW Woman of the Year. The scriptures passages that I chose for today, I thought honored her memory. I found that in two of her writings to Martha, and that Martha sent to me, the scripture passage from Ephesians, I think fit what she saw as her responsibility as a member of the church and being a resident of Centralia. Ephesians says that we should lead a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. She saw it important to maintain unity in the spirit in the bond of peace. She recognized her gift to teach and saw that as her calling. And one of the things that she wrote was called Planting Seeds, and it was a Pentecost meditation. On New Year's Eve, 1981, First Christian Church in Centralia celebrated our 125th anniversary. Part of the celebration included a play set in Central City in 1856 with the Frasers, McCarthy's, Witten's, Myers, Hawkins, and Elder Williams, all charter members of First Christian Church. As we left the church, we felt a great debt we owe to those early members, their faith and courage and willingness to work to see their dreams realized through the teaching of Christ made us more aware of the obligations we have to our future generation. In Ephesians 4, we are told Christ has given each of us special abilities, whatever he wants us to have in our storehouse of gifts. And why we are giving these special abilities, it is that God, as God's people, we will be equipped to do better work for him, building up the church, the body of Christ, to a position of strength and maturity, all become full grown in the Lord. And yet, with hesitation, we are afraid to measure up, unwilling to commit precious time, fearful of facing the true picture of our discipleship. Abraham Lincoln put it this way, I am not bound to succeed, but I am bound to live up to what life I have. We are all called to live up to our talents, to let our light shine for Christ and his church, to do our part to help us build a future for future generation. And she always had a prayer after everything she wrote, so I'm going to share with you the prayer that she had. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the courage and dreams of our founding fathers for their willingness to work to establish our church. Help us, Father, that we may truly put our faith in action in our daily lives by work and deed, that we may live up to the light of the Spirit within us. Amen. And she signed it, Virginia Malden. The scripture passage from Matthew was found in the minutes from a CWF meeting dated August 15th. In it, she mentions the importance of being the light of the world. She saw her work in the community and her work in the church as a way to praise God. When I think back to my visits with her, Virginia always was smiling and she was being the light to the world. CWF General Meeting, August 15, 2005, Virginia Whitlock. The recent evening light show provided by the hot weather lightning and the amazing success of our church's recent capital campaign had me thinking about light shining brightly. I remember a story about a nobleman in a village in Europe who decided to leave a legacy to his townspeople. It was a church. It was beautiful. Everyone marveled at the building. Then someone asked, where are the lights? The noble man pointed to some brackets on the wall and gave each family a lamp, which they were to bring with them each time they came to church. He 
plane, each time you are here, the area where you will be will be lighted. Each time you are not, that area will be dark. This is to remind you that wherever you whenever you fail to come, some part of God's house will be dark. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16, we read, You are the light of the world, like a city on a mountain glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light under a basket. Instead, put it on a stand and let it shine for all. In some way, let your deeds shine for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. Reverend Jen McLean, a former minister, encouraged us to read scripture and study background, when, where, to whom it was written, and then bring it down to application in our lives today. Heeding his advice, how can we apply the scripture to our busy lives? Our faith in God our, and our expression of love for God and our fellow human beings sometimes becomes lost in forms and empty gestures. We are overwhelmed just with simple forms, taxes, address changes, catalog orders, and on and on. Even the computer can't eliminate all of these. We rush from meeting to meeting, young mothers from work to little league to home to and cooking. And we seniors even keep busy, though I must admit some or that it is just because it takes us longer to do things. Our lives really take on meaning only when we add the light of love to all we do. When we love and concern for others takes precedent over our concern for self. Doesn't Christ mean that in our faith? Our light must result in taking time to praise a friend or a stranger for a job well done, to visit the lonely, the discouraged, to send a note or give a ride, to provide a meal or a welcome. I know, I know, telling this to all of you is like preaching to the choir. There are many here tonight who visit the sick, the lonely, provide transportation or a meal, send notes or cards. But the truth is, there is more to be done. So when we do start, the answer is so simply that it frightens me. We start where we are now, today. Find a need near at hand with God's help, express our faith, and let our light shine through our actions. My daughter sent this poem when I told her about the devotional, and it seems to capture what I'm trying to say in a more poetic way. Go light your world. And she has a few verses. Carry your candle. Run to the darkness. Seek out the hopeless, confused and torn. Hold out your candle for all to see. Take your candle and go light your world. We are a family whose hearts are blazing. We raise our candles and light up the sky, praying to our Father in the name of Jesus. Make us beacons in the darkest time. Carry your candle, run to the darkness, seek out the helpless, the deceived, and poor. Hold out your candle for all to see it. Take up your candle, go light up your world. And she has a prayer. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the gift of another day. Help us to take our light of love and share kindness, compassion, and consideration to those around us. May your light shine through us and light the way for others. Amen. In a letter she wrote to Martha on April 27, 1994, she indicates her philosophy. I haven't climbed any mountains recently. I probably never will, but I work daily at Little Hills. She also wrote in a letter that they were discussing Ecclesiastes at Bible, at Bible study. She said that the lesson she learned from this is to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. That is indeed a gift from God. 
Virginia, dear one, thank you for your smiles. I know you are smiling now because you are with God. Now, both Amy and Susan sent me a few things to read. And this is from Amy. We call her Moose. All right, Moose. We call her Moose. We talk about everything, even things that were hard to talk about. We talked about she was always a comfort and always a strength and always real and honest with me. Attached is something I gave to my grandmother for Christmas almost a year ago. She and I had a very unique and special relationship. I guess in some ways I would say she was my person. Anyone who knew me knew about my grandmother. My whole life, she has been the person who was interested in what was happening with me. She's been the person that pointed me away from negativity and to reality and truth. She was interested in my latest bow. She always wanted to know my happening and about the dance at school. She wanted to know what was happening with Mike. She always asked about him. She was always inter interested in what was going on with the kids. She wanted to know about my activities and what I was involved in, and she wanted to know how I was doing. My sister and I would always kind of kid her when we were at my grandmother's house. She would put us in Martha Washington hair curlers. However, she also loved to take us shopping and some of my most fun outfits were the ones that she bought for me. Our grandparents always took us to the most lovely places, out to the country club for lunch or to swim, or she would take us and let us drive the golf cart when she was playing golf. She wasn't the kind of grandmother that got down on the floor with us necessarily, but she was the grandmother that taught us the cards and listened to our stories and taught me to bake and taught me to take care of the things to, and to be generous, abundantly generous. So much of the best of, my, of me came from her example. I got to know her most when she married Grandpa Dick. He helped bring out the fun side of her that I had not known in my younger years. I was at her wedding to him, and afterwards she took me and my date and two of them out to dinner at Adam's Mark. It was where we had my high school prom and later where Mike and I uh, had our reception. She and Dick were always welcoming and interested in me. I still have the Simba that they gave me for graduation from high school. They cared about the things I cared about and they didn't have a perfect marriage. There was lots of hard times, but even in the hard, she would point me back towards the truth. When you make a commitment, you keep it even when it's hard. That it wasn't our job to change people. It was our job to love them for who they were and help them see the best in them. The people are full of faults, so many faults, all of us are. But when we see the best in people, we see the best in life. Dick and Mike had a really special relationship and I think in some ways they kind of teased us about all the formalities that my family goes to. But it was in the teasing that I also learned not to take myself too seriously and to love life abundantly and to be confident in who I am. And that was, and that, it, that I wasn't going to be that for everybody, but that I was just loved the way that I am. I came to remember Dick, I came to remember Dick was in for surgery and so she and I met at Drury Inn one night for dinner, and we talked about all kinds of silly stuff, early marriage stuff with Mike and I, and how hard things were. And she took my hand and she looked at me and said, it would not get wilder with age, but it does get better. We, and, we, and to look for the good always, and to look for the good in others. My entire life I can remember about five o'clock or so having a drink, just one drink, always before dinner, 
And then later, in, her later, in later years, it included a piece of chocolate. These are the great traditions and great times to just talk about and reflect on the day. She introduced me to Colorado and to Florida, and most of my favorite places to be on vacation for places that she and GP or Dick took us to. My last year of college, one of my girlfriends and I spent spring break with she and Dick down in Florida, and she was so silly. She, buy, she would buy me lemons and help me lighten my hair. I wanted to know who we met on the beach. The gal that I was with was turning 21 and we went out to dinner and the three of them had drinks and she was very certain that I was not yet 21, therefore I was not yet to have a drink. Since we had kids, she had been abundantly involved always with them. The last several years she would go over to Centralia and take her to Harvey's for lunch or to the park or out for a drive, and so many things I have forgotten about. Their house on the lake where we used to shop, stories about neighbors, or where my grandfather worked at the bank, or different places she lived around town. We would drive whenever, wherever she wanted to go for as long as she wanted to go, and she always was abundantly gracious and grateful for the time we spent together. Even on the cold and rainy days, when she didn't think she wanted to go out, she would tell me it was always good to be together. She would say the weather might be crummy, but it's always good to be together. Or if the sun was shining and it was warm, she would always talk about how it felt good on her skin. One of the last sentences she spoke to me was Sunday before she died. I told her I was taking the kids and Mike to Florida and we would be gone for a week. She was kind of done that day. She put the phone on the windowsill and she took out a hearing aid. And the nurse came and opened the window so that she and I could just talk. And I put my hand on the screen and she put her hand on the screen and it was starting to rain. And I told her we would be going to Florida and it would be warm. And she said the sun would look good. I would feel it would feel good on my skin, and I said it will feel good on my skin, and it felt good on my skin that week. And I read to her and sang to her the last few days she was here, and I would talk to her and I told her all the things that I love about her, and that I was going to miss her. And Thursday night when I got ready to leave, I told her how hard it was to leave because I wasn't ready to say goodbye. And I didn't think I could say goodbye because she was my person and she got me. And as God and I, and as God is and always was, so faithful to do. Friday, she and I had some time in the hospital to just take time and reflect. Well, she didn't talk much, I talked. And my cousin sent me a song that led us, uh, that led us to another song. And it became our song because it said, this is not goodbye. This is I love you to take with you until we meet again. And we probably listened to the song a half dozen times and I would sing and, and pause it and talk to her. And when my mom came in, came back, I told her and I think she thought it was kind of crazy. When moves that is with moves that it was not goodbye. I was, I love you, to take with you until we meet again. I don't know if it to be true, but I have to believe she kind of knew I was leaving town, and she knew I would have a hard time leaving, and leaving her in the hospital. And so I am so thankful that God was gracious enough to take her while Mom and I were there with her together. All of me loves all of her, and all of her loves all of me. My life will not be the same without her, but it will never be the same because of her. She loved me well, and I will miss her dearly. And these are everything I needed to know I learned from Grandma Moose and still from Amy. Love Jesus deeply. He keeps us grounded in all life storms. Wine tastes better in Waterford. And I have to agree with her on that one. <laughs> Be thankful for people who love you, for who you are. 
be authentic, kind, and hospitable. Every day, have a drink, just one, about five, and a couple pieces of chocolate. There is always something to be celebrated. Birthdays are a big deal. Warm sunshine is good for the soul. The best days are those spent together. Children need to be cared for above all others. There are some things we just couldn't do anything about. It's what it is. Be good to your mother. Keep your commitment always. It's okay to love more than one. Be true to yourself. A drive in the sunshine is always a good idea. See the world and then be happy to be home. Love your family well. That there was no one in this world as fantastic as our muse. And this, this one is from Susan. And she helped me. No to the minister. Moose rides with news. <laughs> we called her Moose. It was a creative grandma name. Our grandpa GP came with a nickname from, and I'm going to do this in the French. Uh, it was uh, to say Moose, because the English one is translation is not good. <laughs> a small bouquet of flowers given as a gift. Indeed, Moose was a gift. Moose was always kind and always serving others. Her smile beamed and her laugh was filled with joy. She was a woman of perseverance, strength, hard work, with grace, kindness, generosity, and true selflessness. Growing up, we enjoyed a great weekend with Moose and GP, ribs on Friday night, parties for breakfast on Saturday, then the farmer's market, and church here on Sunday. We visited relatives, bought groceries for Aunt Dorothy who didn't drive, visited GP's many relatives, and took flowers to graves of, of departed relatives. That was booze, always serving. Whether it was serving on a board, serving the family, teaching Sunday school, or climbing up and down the attic steps throughout the holidays, season basty fruitcake to give, she worked hard, and served others with grace. Moose always delighted in hosting for others, from large gatherings like GP's birthday celebration with her coconut cake, or her Christmas Day brunches for neighbors and relatives, to smaller family gatherings with incredible homemade Thanksgiving rolls on New Year's Day, cornbread and beans. She hosted her beloved, she hosted us at her beloved beach house in Florida created wonderful memories with trips to Colorado. She was a wonderful grandmother, and she adored her daughter. Nearly every get-together, she commented to me how pretty my mother looked and how great her pie crusts were. <laughs> Nearly every time I spoke to her, she expressed gratitude for how much my mom and dad did for her. Moose adored her daughter, and I know is grateful, so grateful, for all she had she and my dad did to take care of her. A hallmark of gatherings was Moose saying grace. I can hear her praying reverently and meal blessings filled with these and vows. In her Bible devotions, the thing constantly underlined or starred and important to her was the legacy. I think she can be proud that she leaves a legacy with family who also reveres the Lord. While we miss her here on earth, we are so grateful we will one day join her in heaven and spend our eternity with her. Another bit of her wisdom comes from a sentence she underlined boldly in her Bible in Hebrews 12, 1. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. She wrote next to it in her signature cursive, Summary of the Christian Life, and how it summarized her life well. When she took me to Vandalia as an adult and showed me where she grew up, she talked with gratitude about even the toughest parts of her life. In her later years, too, when life offered reason to be frustrated or disappointed, she was not one to complain or blame, but to persevere with grace, kindness, and dignity. 
whose ran with endurance and grace the race God had set before her. She underscored the note in the verse, suffering is training ground for Christian maturity. It develops our patience and makes our final victory sweet. What a sweet final victory you have, Moose. Moose lived 99 years of gratefulness, kindness, endurance, and selflessness, and lived and left the legacy of love for Jesus. I close with this passage she especially marked in her Bible from Psalm 100, 4 through 5. It captured well her gratefulness, her love for Jesus, her homegoing, and her legacy. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. I invite us to join in our affirmation of faith. Let us say again what we believe. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for we know that in everything God works for good, with those who love God, who are called according to God's purposes. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor power, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we open our hearts to you just as we are. We celebrate your gift of life freely given to us, but are grieved by a sense of loss in the face of death. The love which binds us to one another leaves us aching as ties are broken. Accept our tears as emblems of devotion and transform them into the waters of life to nourish us in the days ahead. God of all mercies and all comfort, in tender love and compassion, embrace your sorrowing servants. Be their refuge and their strength, and ever-present help in troubled times. Show them again the love that Christ passes, all understanding. For by death Christ has conquered death, and by rising Christ has opened to all of us the gates of everlasting life. O God, whose days are without, without end, and whose mercies cannot be counted, awaken us to the shortness and uncertainty of human life. By your Holy Spirit, lead us in faithfulness all our days. When we have served you in our generation, may we be gathered with those who have gone before us, having the testimony of a good conscience and communion of your holy church and the confidence of a certain faith and the comfort of a saving hope and favor with you, our God, and at perfect peace with the world. Through Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. As I said earlier that Virginia and I would always hold hands and say the Lord's Prayer together, so I invite us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join in singing how great thou art. <laughs>
Savior. We command you, your servant, Virginia Maldine Whitlock, acknowledge we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a daughter of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and in the company of the saints of light. God of all mercies and all comfort, in tender love and compassion, embrace your sorrowing servants. Be their refuge and their strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Show them again the love of Christ that passes all understanding. For by death Christ has conquered death, and by rising Christ has opened to all of us the gates of everlasting life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Holy One, now let your servant go in peace. Your words have been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the light of every people, a light to reveal to the nation and the glory of your people. May God bless you and keep you. Amen. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you.